Welcome to the Grappling We Re- See exactly. Grappling Rewind Podcast. Welcome to this week on the Grappling Rewind Podcast. In this week's show, we're going to recap Fight to Win 136 in San Diego, California, headlined by Kenan Duarte versus uh, Trator, and we are also going to preview Substars that happens in Miami. We will also be previewing Submission Underground 11 and the Arteza Invitational 2. As always in the show, I'm your host, Mange, with my co-host, Emil. Hey, doing, Emil? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? Doing pretty doing pretty good. We're off. It's President's Day. Uh, I'm recording this show midday, so uh, I'm having a great day. I got to train this morning. Uh, let's get into it. You, well, let's talk about a little bit of the news going on in the pro BJJ Jesus Christ, space. there's a lot of news this yeah. week. Yeah. We spent about probably almost close to an hour before recording, like going through all of the news items, like I'm talking about that, let's not talk about that, and... Uh, Dude, huge announcement. So, I think the biggest announcement is ADCC has announced, uh, like, I think half of the trials locations for 2020. Yeah, so, so far we have uh, ADCC European trials on October 3rd, 2020 in Moldova. ADCC North American trials on November November 7th in 2020 in New Jersey. So, we got a book, actually, to go up there for that. Yeah, no, it's it's... Believe it or not, like this will sneak up, you know, especially, you know, summer rolls through and then it's, it's, it's by in an instant. And then all of a sudden you're in, you're in trials. Seven months away from November? Um, no, we're in nine, nine months. Really? Yeah. I forgot that we, uh, so then ADCC Asia and Oceania trials, December 5th in Singapore. I think it's really interesting they're in Singapore. I don't recall the last time they've done one in Singapore. They typically do it from my memory, in either Japan or in Australia. So it's really cool that they're in Singapore. Um, watch them have done like every other year in Singapore. But yeah, it's cool. Uh, any other else, Any other dates announced? No, those are it right now. So those are all the 2020 dates. Is Singapore in 2021 or is that still in 2020? 2020. Okay, yeah. So all the 2020 dates for ADCC trials have been announced. Uh, if you want to get a piece of that sweet ADCC action as a competitor, uh, unless you are a world class amazing jiu jitsu guy, you got to do the trials. So, right. Super happy. And I think announced. Gordon said that he's going to be doing the, the Gordon, jersey, Gordon's right? Gordon's been saying a lot of things recently. We have a bunch of Gordon Ryan news because he's got some big matchups announced. But yeah, Gordon's like, I want to do the trials. I'm like, can, can you do that? Like, if he wins, which he probably will if he does the trials, realistically, he's just making another invite slot for someone. They'll probably give it to the silver, is my yeah. guess. Yeah, I, I think it's really funny that Gordon's going to go in, like, as the as the absolute champion that's technically supposed to do the super fight. Then he's going to go as, he's trying to get in ADCC as the divisional champ, too, and actually defend his divisional title and have the absolute super fight with Andre and do the absolute again. And he's going to do trials. I'm like... ADCC is not going to let him do that, but if they do, hey, uh, I'll and if definitely you can pull it off. Up. Yeah, it, I, I, dude, pulling that off would be would be ludicrous, and I think it would set a new precedent. So uh, let's talk about other guys pulling stuff off. Uh, Mikey Musumeci, actually Kyle Terra, has put up ten thousand dollars for Mikey to fight basically giant guys. I think they were saying they were looking for guys about under two twenty is really what they were looking for. They weren't looking for him to fight like Seif again or something like that. But guys, like that 220-ish and below range, I think maybe even 240, like guys like Ali maybe. Yeah. Like that weight class and below. And then Red Bowie jumped in. Yeah. Red Bowie CBD jumped in and said, well, we will match the 10K. And then Bear from uh, Show You Roll jumped in and was like, I'll throw some money down on this. Yeah. There was a really cool interview that Flo Grappling did with Mikey and Kayo. I, th- I forget which podcast. It was either Fish Full of Collars or it was Who's Number One podcast that they do, where it was big, giant interview that they did with, I think it was Who's Number One, um, with Kayo and Mikey. And it's really insightful, especially as like a little guy, yeah. and especially with kind of Mikey going into the open weights and the absolutes, talking about that he hasn't really trained with big guys in the last like three years. And then Kayo laughing and going like, oh yeah, uh, my body was completely broken by your age because I was training with big guys. So it's it was a really interesting interview for that respect that like Kyle is specifically talking about how it broke Mikey's body. And they talked about Mikey doing Europeans and open class and kind of how it broke his body down. I am down to see some of these matchups, but I kind of am concerned for Mikey and like the longevity of well, Roosterweight. And, like, I see, Fetter. I kind of see where he's coming from. And even before they had this interview, I, I see where Mikey's coming from, which is that, okay, it, it appears as though there's every indication that Mikey can run his division. Like, yeah, you know, like it, I, he's had a couple of close matches, but, but he has two losses at black belt in the weight classes yeah. that he's avenged both of like aggressively. Yeah, he's, he's beat Bruno. Now he's beat Tomo Yushi. He's beat all of the guys at rooster and at light feather. Yeah. So, so where do you go? it's like, and I can see Mikey, Mikey clearly likes to challenge himself. Yeah. He likes to go for it. He's clearly trying to make like a huge 
impact on jujitsu. Yes. And so where do you go from that? You you slay some fucking giants and he's going to go and do that. So yeah. I'm excited I'm, for I'm it. excited. Who did Red Bowie say that they were going to uh, I think Red Bowie wants to do Kainan, Kainan, right? Kainan yeah. I think. So there's a couple okay. guys that are kicking around and you'll see, you'll see the comments and Flo, I think, is pushing the Keenan matchup and Red Bowie, I think, is more so pushing the Kainan matchup. The Keenan matchup makes a little bit more sense to me because they both play that like like really insanely technical. Yeah, they will play in, in air quotes there a more technical game. Like it's a more grip fighty game. It's right. a more like. And I, I see Keenan being less hard on Mikey's body. I feel like he is going to play less of that physical grindy game that we can see kind of on play. Again, Keenan can still play that game, but I feel like nowadays he seems to gravitate towards those like outside lapel sweeping games and like coming up on the single legs. And it just seems like a game that's maybe going to damage Mikey less. less. Yeah, Again, and I'm, still I'm, be really entertaining. Yeah, that's the thing. It's going to be so, super entertaining. So I'm And you got American guys going against But other. Mikey also talked about later in his career going up to featherweight as well. So it was, it was a yeah. really interesting interview. If you care about like Musumeci and like what's happening in the lower divisions, listen to the interview. There's a ton of information there from Kyle, from Mikey, from the other guys that were on the call there. Um, what other... I want to talk about the Polaris Grand Prix. Dude, all the names are announced. Yeah, all the names are announced. Uh, it's a stellar lineup. We have, my names here that I of have. course, Kainan Duarte, yep. Patrick Gaudio, Freddie Vosgrown, mm-hmm. Adam Wardzinski, uh, Mikey Perez, Nathan Orchard, Nick Rodriguez, and Edwin Najmi? Nope. Is he on it? No? Nope. Okay. Vosgrove, Orchard, Patrick Gaudio, Perez, Kainan Duarte, Nick Rodriguez, Adam Wardzinski, and we have the Polaris GP qualifier, that, that's which I'm okay, super sorry. excited for yep. because, again, I love, I think it's going to be a 32-man bracket, basically open entry, you sign up for this, you do the bracket. If you win, you get your slot against uh, all of the monsters Fucking that have Nicky ever been Rod monsters. and Kainan Duarte right. and Patrick Gaudio. Like, those are world, you know, that's world-class yeah, talent. Yeah, number one ADCC, number two ADCC, ADCC medalist. ADCC, world like, champ. Like, you know, that's that's a it, ticket if, to be a gym warrior that gets into yes, a main and card. it's an open weight. So, yeah. like Nathan Orchard signed up in there, and I went, it, can't Orchard make 45? Or fifty, I think I think Orchard can make fifty five. Yeah, which is still like Rodriguez is making mm, two fifty five, yeah. right? maybe maybe two forty two thirty five. I think is what he walks around at. But yeah. that's a bunch of big dudes. I'm super excited to see if it's, I think it might be round robin. It might be bracketed. I forget exactly. I need to look into that. Once it gets closer in like two weeks here, probably we'll look more into that. Probably writing an article uh, for the Grappling Rewind on that open weight GP kind of the. Talk about the brackets. Talk about the lineups. Emil, I assume you're going to be running some uh, some numbers potentially. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. So doing a by the numbers matchup of like how that's going to play out. I, again, I'm super. I mean, curious just for the qualifier. L- looking at this lineup, uh, you know, it's hard to pick against Kainan. Yeah, um, it's you know, hard. I do think you know because we know he has wins over Wardzinski. He has wins over. He has two wins over Rodriguez in the recent past. Um, I think he has a win over Gaudio. I don't think he's faced Vostro before. I don't think he's faced Orchard before. I don't. No, if he faced Mike Perez, I don't think he did. If it would, yeah. would have been open weight. But yeah, Kainan has something like six wins over Wardzinski in the past like couple years. So yeah, I think no losses either. Yeah, no. Yeah, so really interesting. I'm super excited for that bracket. There's uh, there's a lot to cover there. Um, I am excited to write the article. I'm excited to preview it in more depth. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, yeah. Gordon Ryan versus Pat Downey got announced. Finally, like, got announced for BJJ Fanatics. Not actually announced for Third Coast. So Third Coast initially had announced this matchup for Third Coast 4 before Gordon was going to face Gaudio. Um, and now the matchup is being done in BJJ Fanatics, and it's going to be a hybrid, like one hybrid wrestling matchup, and then one like jujitsu hybrid matchup. And again, I need to look at the rules more, but it got announced this week for the BJJ Fanatics 170 GP. I think it's just going to be a super fight on that card. Uh, that's dope. Sweet. I'm excited for that. Yeah. Um, again, it's hard to see Pat Downey not taking the wrestling portion of that. Like, yeah. Pat Downey is a world team member, potentially number one or number two slot at the weight class for the U.S. team for the for wrestling in the Olympics. Like, yeah. Pat Downey is another fucking level wrestler. Yeah. Um, and guys, on, guys in the jiu-jitsu space don't really know much about him, but... Dude's a monster. Go watch about go watch his match with Nick Rodriguez at who's number one, the wrestling oh, match for that. Thrashed Nick. Man, it yeah. was just like and again, typically in wrestling, you don't see guys go up weight classes. So for Downer to do that to do like Nick Rodriguez at the weight class. I mean, it's like three weight classes or four weight classes below him. Yeah. It really speaks He ragdolled him, which is crazy. Yeah, it really speaks to the level that and because Nick Rodriguez, we think is one of the best heavyweight wrestlers in jujitsu. There's we don't think anyone I don't think personally anyone in jujitsu can take him down. So you have a guy like Pat Downey come in and like 
work him on the feet like he did in that space, it's a really tough matchup for Gordon. I think yep. it's, it's interesting. I'm super excited for it. Uh, the BGJ Fanatics 170 GP, names are coming out for that. I actually don't have them together here now, but uh, from the names I've seen, there's a lot of fun names. Honestly, it is like I'm not sure what names we could talk about, what names we can't talk about yet, so I don't have the list ready because I know uh, it's going to be dope. What else do we got? Uh, oh, yeah, Third Coast announced a gang of matchups. Um, basic- Dude, well, before we get into that, how about fucking Third Coast and Grapple Fest? That's right? unprecedented. Teaming like- up? Oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Gordon versus Kyle Bame is going to headline that. So there's been a lot of discussion over the recent... So two completely different promotions, one in the U.S., yeah. one in the U.K. You have Grapple Fest in the U.K. putting on amazing events, Third Coast putting on amazing events. They decided to team up cross-promotionally and put on an event where they're going to put their stars against each other, which I think is awesome. Which is amazing. Like, yeah. I'm super excited and about And again, that. goes and it reinforces this whole thing that Maine and I have been talking about, about jiu-jitsu really turning into an international yeah. sport. And this is like, this is a, an awesome kind of... So I talked to Ryan McGuire, the CEO, the, not CEO, sorry, the president and matchmaker for Third Coast Grappling, talked about it, uh, basically who they were matching up and what they were doing. And there are some really cool announcements. Ryan McGuire talked about it on his podcast, uh, 3CG Radio, Third Coast Grappling Radio. Uh, the, one of their latest episodes at length, like all of the matchups that have been announced. Um, there's some really cool stuff. When we get closer to that, I'll preview them. Dude, there are some banger matchups. And then we're finally going to see Bame versus Gordon Ryan. Uh, Bame's been looking for that matchup for a long time. He said Gordon's ducking him, and like Gordon has been in events that he's been that he's been scheduled to compete in, then pulled out of events that he's scheduled to compete in. So we're finally going to see it. And I think it's a no time limit matchup. It's a sub-only, no talent matchup, which I think is the first time we've seen Gordon in one of those since 2016 when he fought Keenan in Grappling Industries. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Yeah, I, it's... You're not as much of a fan of the no time limits. No. No, I I don't I don't care for them. They're not entertaining. Um, you know, I love the them. results might entertain people, but like watching them, nah. Eh. I'm good. I, I, I watched the entirety of the Keenan Gordon one live. So, like, I'll, I'll watch that. Uh, let's see. What other things do we have? In, oh, yeah. Uh, your wire favor got announced for Copa Podio. The uh, U.S. one they're doing in Sacramento. Uh, if you know Faber, Faber is a MMA fighter, title challenger for years. He only ever lost in world title fights at the highest level in MMA. He recently came back, had a tough fight against Peter Yan, where he got stopped, actually. And now he's been a dope grappler for a long time he's on the copa podia card i don't think he's actually in the lightweight gp for copa podia but i think he's in a super fight matchup on that card but it's really cool to see copa podia coming over to the u.s putting on a u.s based card in sacramento and getting a grappler like favor on there uh i think that's all i have for news Mio. do you have any other news no no there's just uh in fact you were telling me that bjj fanatics has rankings up now yeah they do uh they have noogie rankings up it's one on their blog where we write some articles occasionally as well um they put up a giant list of all the ranks and i looked through i was like this is a pretty good ranking i like that we're starting to see more not more agencies and more organizations put up rankings like flow grappling has their rankings that i think are pretty good fanatics has their rankings which i think are pretty good and, and looking through the rankings it's cool because you can see Guys that have recently beat other guys, for the most part, are not ranked above that guy. Right. Like, it's a legitimate ranking system, and it factors in a lot of different organizations. It adds a narrative stuff. to a lot of, yeah. of, you know, matchups, too, where you're, you know, beforehand, if you just saw two names, you'd be like, oh, that's a good matchup. Now, if it's, like, number one versus number four, you know, that suddenly, even though there's a, a lot of gray area there, it still gives you an idea as to what level the competitors right. are. And, and it gives especially the unranked guys some motivation to try to take some of those guys out. Yeah, it, it just, I like, again, it creates a narrative. And I've the more we do this show and the more we kind of cover professional grappling and kind of look at how other sports do things and the narratives behind other sports, I think having that narrative structure and rankings is a really good way to establish that either like artificially or actually right. because it puts a number on a guy and you see oh this guy is ranked here the storyline is he is trying to climb the rankings to become ranked number one and i think right. actually fight to win um does that like they incorporate rankings a lot with like purses and stuff so i'm happy sense. Yeah. i'm happy to see guys like it gives a framework okay, i'm ranked number one i can point to this and it it serves as a point of negotiation for what I'm worth on a super fight event. Look, look, I'm ranked number one. I'm, I'm the number five Nogi guy in the world at plus eight, at under 88 kilograms. Like I have value. I am the t- one of the top level guys 
here's this ranking system. This guy's ranked number six. I'll definitely fight him. I'm excited for it. So I'm, su- I'm happy that we're seeing more organizations put up rankings. Um, it's good for the sport, and it'll help me basically uh, preview matchups when I don't have a meal to basically run a, uh, a stats breakdown on it. <laughs> you got anything else, Emil? That's it. All right, that does it for news. So on to a recap of Fight to Win 136 took place in San Diego, California, paid at a total of $45,120 in salaries and commissions, was headlined by Black Belt Kanan Duarte versus Vinicius Ferreira Trator. Is it, it's not Tractor, it's Trator. Trator, yeah. Which literally until this week, I think uh, Simon wrote an article, and I looked at it, I was like, oh, that's not Tractor, that's Trator. Yeah. Oh, I've been calling him the wrong name. Well, it's like the American, I think, you know, or the English I, version of Trator. Yeah, and it's spelled differently, and it's yeah. pronounced differently because it's a different word. I just laughed at myself like, cool, I've been only, it's again, in true Grappling Ryan fashion, I butchered a high-level competitor's name for mm, a year. Well, you weren't wrong. It's just different language. But yeah. uh, quick errata. I believe last week we said that this was this took place in Los Angeles, um, but it's San Diego. It obviously. was listed yeah, in Los yeah. Angeles, yeah. which is why. And that's why I was confused. Yeah. I saw all these San Diego guys. I yeah, like, exactly. I, it looks like a San thing. Diego card, but it was listed as Los Angeles. So I was correct in what I thought. Yes. I recognized where guys are from, yep. uh, which explains all the Atos people on the card. Yeah, and exactly. literally all of the high-level people that were there in San Diego because San Diego. My brother trained to San Diego. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll, yeah, you we'll talk about, about that at the, at the end of the show. Yeah. We'll talk about that. My brother getting into jiu-jitsu, and I was like, Hell oh, this yeah. is really funny. So, Kanan Duarte versus Vinicius Ferreira. Uh, Kanan wins, defeats uh, Vinicius via decision, becomes the fight to win heavyweight Nogi champion. Yeah, this this match was um, a lot of kind of slow stand-up. Um, it, w- it was they definitely... Called it, the a, commentators even said forehead to forehead. It's kind of like that jiu-jitsu, yeah. like almost like you know waltz where you're walking mm-hmm. back and forth with the other person, feeling them out, except the feeling out period didn't seem to really end there there were a couple of takedown attempts like kainan hit a foot sweep but like yeah. you know it, not a whole lot of committal neither guy really was incentivized to come in and push a heavy action i think really kainan kainan wins here via just kind of putting up more pressure mm-hmm. um, he, when they were on the ground he did a little bit more he was coming forward more he just was a little more active i think he wins on activity it was a super close match yep because of just like the way that each guy kind of cancer each other out and both were looking for something that the other person was not going to give them. Mm-hmm. And that was the entirety of the match for the most part. That um, was so it. Kanon takes that. Yep. I have matched his name three different times, three different ways. Uh, I'm honestly super curious to see who he gets matched up against next in Fight to Win. Yeah. Um, Herbert wouldn't surprise me. Um, there's a bunch of guys that I'd be super excited to see him against. I mean, at this, at this point, especially both just be, from the promotional standpoint we're seeing a lot of huge names um come in this as, for this heavyweight, this heavyweight and now with with Kainan like this is an opportunity for anyone to who wants to to go and take on you know one of the best yeah. people in jiu jitsu period and not in a points rule set if you really want to put it try try to put it to him right. like you have the opportunity if to you do want so. to you can take risks and try to submit him right. good luck with that yeah no. uh, <laughs> has when's the last time Kainan's been submitted uh Murgali. Mergali fucking um, choked him at Bra- oh, Brasileira. 2019, 18? Yeah, 2019, 2019, I think. 2019. I'm honest, I wish, I'm, I'm curious to see if Seth will kind of rescind his position on Mergali and uh, we'll see that match. I'm sure he will. I yeah. think Seth has been cooling off a, a lot lately. So. Yeah, we actually Seth's on this card. <clears throat> yeah, we'll, 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 talk about, we'll talk about him. We'll talk about his match. So next up, we have Jenna Bishop defeating Gabby McComb by split decision. And she retains the fight to win bantamweight title for the women. So this was, this was a, a great match. Um, I think the deciding factor Factor here is one of Maine's favorites, which is namely uh, several slams that Gemma, Jenna put on Gabby. I love slams. Um, and these were legit, man. These were like oh, yeah. serious big, fucking slams. Like, they're the big slams that will cause you to open up a position after you get hit with one or two of them. Even though the fight to win mats are relatively like pro wrestling and kind of springy and softer, you get slammed a couple times, you're still not going to hold those positions. You're going to open up, look for the underhooks, look for the leg positions, look for yeah. like to get out of the slamming position. Yeah, and it doesn't things. matter like how compliant those mats are the whiplash is still real oh yeah um and and so yeah there was multiple slams here that jenna got and in the fight to win rule set a slam counts as a submission attempt yes so you're you're also scoring points here um and um and that was like some of the largest 
uh, by the fight to win rule set, Correct. like points that came out. Um, and then in the last seconds, Gabby also uh, was in a spider web arm bar that looked pretty good, but um, Jenna was able to pop out. And so that, that was that. Um, yeah. And Jenna, Jenna takes it. Jenna takes the decision. Next match, we had Ron Henderson defeating Christian Woodmancy via decision to become the fight to win flyweight champion. So there was a ton of leg entanglements here, lots of 50-50. This is a great match if you want to see leg control and being able to switch between like outside Ashigrami to like 50-50. Also, if you want to see a super active flyweight match in the gi. Oh, my God. And just toe holds all over the place. Right. Oh, my You've God. You talked about this before we recorded yeah. about how difficult it probably was to score this match. And like, where do you count at what point for guys? Again, the speed these two dudes move is impressive. And there's a lot of like really cool um, like meta stuff I'll talk about at the end here. But how do you score it? Because yeah, it's, what, at what point is the toehold get turned over enough where you score it? Or sometimes the toehold's getting turned on, then let go, then reestablished. Right. right. Like all of these. Because like, it's one of those things like the Kimura that's both a grip and a submission, right? And right. so um, we, you see them kind of like rolling through a lot and then maintaining it more for just control and, and having grips and then going for it again. It's really, really difficult. There's, you know, multiple moments where there's double toe holds and in, in no case do you see when the toe hold is, is being applied, like grimacing from either a competitor or that, you know, when people go from like 50% to like a hundred percent movement yeah, when they're like, rolling, Oh shit. We're both guys are rolling. And all yeah. of a sudden you see one guy like flip turn out super fast and hard. You're like, okay, that's a tight toe hold. Or yeah. they're going to try to spin underneath or you don't let go of that. their own toe hold. Like, yeah. so each, but again, it's submissions that require defense so it's like both are sort of being defended but, but there's multiple get... times when like they 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 wouldn't defend it they'd be like fine you can have that i'm gonna do my own attack and it's right. like how do you score we'll that try to take so it back and really it's tricky really uh. interesting match because i again i like the smaller guys in the gi that are willing to play this thing this kind of game where they're gonna go 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 and both guys it's cool look like they're used to being the faster guy and I love watching that. You watch two guys that are that want to play the fast game and don't want to give up on that. Like, I'm going to get there first. Another cool thing I thought in this match was you see a little bit at the beginning um, that like really heavy point style where both guys are kind of kneeling and you see Ron and Christian like will pick at that front side leg for like the uh, for the sweep. Right. Basically, it counts as a takedown if you're super squatted and low like that. And it's something you see in a in a point is system. In a, in a point system. But you see uh -huh. both guys really at that range looking for that at the beginning of the match. And I thought it was really interesting. Like, oh, yeah, both these guys are really heavy points guys. And so that's something in the meta, especially at the smaller levels, at the smaller weight classes, you see people picking at that front leg really, really aggressively. At the bigger weight classes, guys typically can't squat down as low as that. And so reaching at that front leg from the squatted position is something you see less. I thought it was a really interesting thing from a metagame perspective that you saw kind of on display at the beginning of this match when guys are looking for that first two points. Even though this wasn't a points match, you still see that aspect of the game kind of being implemented. So next up, we have Johnny Souza defeating Nick Green by split decision. Becomes the fight to win Masters middleweight champion. After that, we have Edwin Najmi defeating Johnny Tama by decision. Dude, Najmi is really fucking good at triangles. Yeah, he's amazing at triangles. By the way, uh, quick aside, his corn rows were dope. Uh, they were, right? Yeah. Like, I looked at it, I was like, look at He kind of looked like Nipsey Hussle here a little <laughs> Dude, bit. He, like, he totally rest in peace. That. That's uh, exactly what I thought. I don't know. Yeah. It's like the shape of his head. Or it's also, it was the short corn, corn rows. They didn't With like, the come long down super beard. low and yeah. a long beard. I was like, yeah. he he looks like Nipsey Hussle. I'm yeah. super happy that you saw the exact same thing yeah. I did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, um, Funny enough, the way that this match starts is Johnny jumps guard because he just, just does not, he doesn't want well, none of that fucking flying no, triangle heat. There is, I, I said this, uh, I think off, off air, I think Edwin Najmi is probably the best dude in the world to flying triangle. Like, he has a flying triangle win over Mergali at fucking, he's the reason I think it purple belt that Mergali didn't double double in the Gia Nogi Grand Slam, or sorry, in the weight in absolute Grand Slam. Wow. Is because Edwin Najmi flying triangle. I think that's what happened. Edwin Najmi flying triangle him at some event. That's buck wild. And it's crazy. Like, you see the way, and I forget who was talking about it this week, talked about the way Edwin throws the flying triangle. We don't see the flying triangle from Edwin here until the end, but I want to talk about it because I love watching a guy that's super, super good at one move. Like, And it's like, he's really good at that move. He like will jump up almost to your neck and head with his body when he throws it. He doesn't throw it underneath or like throw up on you. He'll jump up to you 
and then latch on. And it's a really interesting way that he throws it. So yeah. this is also, we're seeing like what Tama, Tama came off, uh, he's Nogi World Champion win, I want to say like a month and a half, like two months ago, something like that, right at the tail end of 2019, he took that giant flying knee to his face on a guard pass and was still to win the Nogi World Championship. So this is a fun match. This was in the Gi, though. Yeah, so basically the way the match goes is um, uh, Edwin goes to Toriendo Pass and does an amazing job at it to the point where um, we see Johnny Tama turtle. And Edwin does something really interesting here, which is, um, you know, I've seen this in judo before, uh, less so in jiu-jitsu, but from the turtle position, just, you know, shooting into a triangle from the yeah. back um, that's kind of like an, an inverted well, position. A, said, you said, we were talking about this earlier, it's an inverted triangle from the back is what Edwin sort of starts to lock up here and ends yeah. up for a good point. And, and it's match. also a reverse triangle too. Yes, yeah, sir. It's a reverse um, triangle from the back, not inverted triangle, reverse triangle yeah. from the back. And, um, you know, it's it's an amazing control position and Edwin sits on it for a while, eventually isolates arm, he starts doing Kimura grip stuff. Um, it's a super difficult position to yeah, like this is one of the few positions that I consider almost a dead end position yeah. when you get stuck in it because yeah. especially in the gi with all that friction, it is so hard to turn and get your body out. We see it versus the in the Nikki Sullivan match, right. a really similar like, kind of like triangle from the back. It's very, very difficult unless the person lets go and decides to go to something else to escape that position with all the friction of the gi. And this is actually what happens with this match is that Edwin for a while fights, goes for the Kimura, keeps fighting for their leg triangle, um, keeps fighting, and then eventually goes, okay, I'm not going to get this, let's go, and then Tama ends up turning out and basically escaping that position once Najmi actually decides to let it go. And then in the last six seconds, Najmi throws up his signature flying triangle, um, and then gets a trap triangle. Kind of gets slammed. Yeah, gets slammed and a little I, bit. And I, I, did interview, I did an interview with Najmi at uh, Third Coast Grappling. It, I think it might have been part of the interview. might have been just speaking with him at the event. He's like, yeah, uh, every single match I've taken recently, I get slammed. I'm not sure why I feel like I'm the guy that always is getting slammed in these matchups. I want to do stuff with less slams. And then he ends up getting slammed in this match too. But super good performance from Najmi. Again, that trial control that he's able to implement against Tama is is really, really good. And we get to see some flying triangle action from Najmi, which is always a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Great match. So Michael Liera Jr. defeats Peter Frank by rear naked choke. Uh, this one was quick. This is buck wild. And in fact, like... Like I, I personally would have given this submission of the night because it was fucking amazing. This or actually it's Seth's match, but this match was amazing. It, it, I think it lasts under forty seconds. It goes right so that. quickly that they didn't even have time to get the match timer up, so you you don't even see like how much time has elapsed. And basically, uh, what happens is Lira pulls, yep. and then immediately goes for what you think is going to be like the double ankle sweep, the dummy sweep, but instead of going dummy sweep, he pushes Peter's legs together. And then he just spins to the outside and does what Mio was saying is like a baby bolo. Yeah, to, it's a, to his back. It's a baby bolo. Um, it's it's an it's amazing. And like I, you're right in that. Uh, aside from the dummy sweep, I don't see people taking this leg positioning a whole lot because no. both of Liera's legs are on the outside. Yeah, right. So it's it's if he wanted to, he could De La Hiva hook on either side, which is what I assumed he was going to do. Right. But it's really interesting. He kind of. The setup for this was really cool to watch because you see Lear pull and then get right underneath Frank to like go to so the dummy he, sweep. He him. gets he gets one ankle like you would for a De La Hiva or like yes. one ankle for the the dummy sweep, and that's all he needs. And so basically, he starts like doing a deep De La Hiva hook on that side, and then with the other foot, like squishing. Um, Peter's legs together and then also tipping him over. Yeah. And while he tips, Liera is able to really amazingly like position himself right underneath so that Peter falls basically into his lap with kind of like kiss of the dragon. Yeah. With yeah. Uh, the same finishing where they sit into your lap at the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But a baby, uh, it's a baby ball. Baby yeah, ball. It's a lot closer of a move. Um, and so he's there. Boom. Throws on. A rear naked choke. I think he has one arm. Saliera so has one of Peter's arms trapped with his legs. I don't recall. Yeah, he, he does. Okay. It's just, I can't remember if it's right off of that back take or not. But um, yeah, locks amazing it, finish. Locks in a rear naked face. Yeah, uh, rear naked face. Yeah. We're facing the other direction, so I can't really see exactly where on the face it was, but it definitely didn't look like under the chin. It looked like a 90 degree It like, looked face like crank. squeeze, squeeze on the face. But I, again, I was really interested here uh, with how Liera is able to get 
uh, Peter's legs so close together. Like it's yeah. a really interesting way to do that. And I want to go back and watch it from a match study perspective because you don't see a lot of guys go from that double ankle to basically able to get their opponent's legs so close together to make the angle around. What's really, really interesting, interesting is that the announcer, one of the commentators, to, like said specifically before this really even started to engage that Liera really likes this particular sweep, and then sure enough, the sweep happens, and as he's as it's happening. The commentator's like, yeah, see, I, I was just telling you guys about this sweep. Yeah. So was definitely go back and watch it. I can't remember who was saying it at yeah. the time. We swapped commentary for a couple of matches during the night. There was Lister on commentary at one point. Yeah. There was it was Hanger. not Lister, I know that. Okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's this back take is dope. Go and watch it. Mm -hmm. um, next up, we have uh, Corey Paredes defeating Barrett Yoshida by decision. Not a, not a ton of action in the match. It a lot was of really double-seated open guard. Yeah, for in the this majority case, of the match. Honestly. It seemed like Corey's grips were like unshakable. And like, yeah. I think Corey seemed a little bit more to be able to dictate where the match was going. I'm assuming that's where the decision came from. Yeah, he just looked like he was this slightly, just kind of one step ahead, just sort of p taking taking more dominant positions. But again, it was a really, really close match. Um, in Bush, we see Yoshida typically play a more active game, but gets slowed down here in the gi, and that was the match. Um, next up, we have Sofia Nordano uh, defeating Nikki Sullivan by footlock. This was dope. This is on my list for potentially either sub of the night or fight of the night, just given like the reversal here. So two things happen in this match. One, Nikki Sullivan locks up a reverse, or sorry, a regular triangle from the back. And I was like, okay, then Sofia's going to have to tap. It's done. And, and and like Nikki starts isolating the arm too and yeah. like really pulling yeah, it not, back. not finishing the triangle like yeah. starting to finish the shoulder lock armbar combo from the back that if yep. you've ever been in that position it, it is murderous but I and I was thinking about this after we took notes on this match um, potentially this is where you see the flexibility of a lot of the women come into play because the shoulders aren't as tight and so you have a little bit more time because typically there's there's joint flexibility there that's not present in a lot of the guys that are more tight. Sophia is able to kind of turn her arm out and like she's able to fight in this extended arm position for a little longer than I think most guys are able to. So it's really kind of like, oh, yeah, look at that. She can fight there where my shoulder would explode. Yeah. Or, and, I mean, maybe she just had a lot of heart, too. It's, you know, it's impossible to It was to definitely tell. deep. But yeah. It was, it was a cool like transition. Um, and Nordano is able to basically turn all the way through in this body triangle and Sullivan kind of starts to lock up the next position series. Well, she's, she readjusts to a reverse triangle and loses a little bit of the like grip. And then eventually, um, you know, Nikki, it loses the triangle entirely. Yeah. Um, and here, uh, they, that one point get to double seated open guard. And Sophia just grabs one of the legs, doesn't have, like tight control over the leg says fuck it doesn't matter and slams on a really high esteem yeah lock. i thought i saw the same thing where the position so typically when you see an esteem lock you see it done almost in like the gut like hers and the, and the camera angle is not perfect for the finish it looks like it was up in the sternum yeah it looks yeah. like high sternum like between like the pec muscles almost yeah. it was really really high but you see i watched it a couple times to figure out like wasn't it a steam lock was it like a toe hold like i couldn't tell i mean in general the esteem lock I mean, is, it is, but I was curious if she had the grip where it was the foot was in the chest, like yeah. an esteem lock, well, or I if think it was just the hand. The esteem, the esteem lock is really fascinating because it's one of those, like, and this is true for many, 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 many moves in jiu-jitsu where it's like there's no one correct move to do it. But I feel like yeah. you see a lot of very different finishes to the esteem lock. Yeah. There's some that look like toe holds, some that look like heel hooks. You know, it, it all there's depends. There's some guys that do it super crushed over. There's some people that do it super Extended high. out. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, like but it was. guillotine almost finish. Yes. You know, this. So I think honestly, like however you do it, clearly she had enough purchase and friction there high up on the sternum. It was a quick tap, you know, yeah. like. I was just really impressed because you didn't see a whole lot of the leg control in there as well. So I'm guessing it was finished just as like the top ligaments of the foot got turned over. But it was a really cool finish. It's not a position I see the esteem lock finished from uh, very regularly at all. I can't honestly recall the last time I've seen one. I think I have seen a finish like this before, but I can't recall who did it or when it was done. So mm -hmm. really cool finish. Nice position of control. And coming out of that deep reverse triangle from the back. or yeah. sorry, triangle yeah, from come the from back. behind win for sure. Yeah, and then immediately reverses it to get this esteem lock. Like, it was really cool. Again, it was. it's a, definitely a match to go and rewatch because tons of heart from Sophia and then is able to pull it out with that esteem lock. Because, again, had that been the match, like, Sullivan would have definitely taken the decision. Oh, yeah, so it would have been hard. She knew she had to pull it out. Yep. And getting getting that triangle from the back, 
you're going to have to put up some huge amount of positional offense to, in the judge's eyes, make it equal. So you have to go for the sub. She's able to do it. Yep. Super impressive match. Awesome match. Um, great come from behind victory. So we have Paul Silva defeating Jair Silva by armbar. And that was submission of the night for the black belts. So this is pretty like straightforward match. Paul is in full guard with Jair kind of like um, up upright and like passing from feet. And Paul just basically gets some uh, really nice grips on the arm, is able to pendulum nicely he's up high on his shoulders shoots zip up hips up high for a nice arm bar i really know. liked what paul did here uh for how he established the grip because he starts this basically he starts the whole arm bar sequence like the pendulum arm bar, arm bar from the guard and he uses the same side hand to grab like that really tight gi grip behind the tricep and then he goes on the same side he grabs like a nice deep collar grip and then uh, Silva lifts him up to start like just a standard guard break and Paul's able to like lift his hips up to the shoulder really well and just pendulum over and get it but I really like that like deadlift control point you can get because that tricep grip behind the gi is super hard to break and you can pull it into your body and lift off it really well in combination with the same side collar grip it's a really nice lifting position and he's able to get his hips up with those grip sequences and it's like it's an underratedly strong position to lift from, and it's cool to see it hit at a black belt level. Absolutely. Next up, we have Seth Daniels himself defeating Dustin Peak by electric chair. Seth Daniels, CEO of Fight to Win, uh, going through some stuff recently, and he decided to jump on his car for the first time in a while. I think first time since neck surgery. Yeah, it's right? been a long time. It's been, I think we covered Seth at the beginning of 2019 on Fight to Win. Um, I think before his DVD came out was the last time that we would have covered him. His DVD where, by the way, he has four signature moves, in which case, in this match, he finishes with one of his four signature yeah. moves. I yeah. think the DVD is called Seth Only Knows Four Moves, and it's basically like the James Brown, it's like a, a judo foot sweep, it is a, an electric chair, and it, it's like a twister, and it might be like a Kimura sequence or something like that. Yeah, but it's really it's like four smart. moves that Seth, like, if you watch Seth on Fight to Win, that's, that all, is what, that's all what he wins with. Yep. And, you know, we see him off the bat from standing going for that foot sweep. But then Seth is able to get a really nice behind the back gi grip. Um, and then like over top where the back patch is going to be. And if, if you start, if you grab that grip, it's really, really easy. And to like, break the posture. Yeah. And yeah. you can just push a guy's hips down and like, sorry, shoulders down really, really well. It's also really hard to break that grip because it's behind you. There's nothing you can do to, I mean, unless you literally completely disengage and push away or like you shoot or get lower. To I think you have to shoot basically. Like, you, well, and even though you don't break the grip, the guy has yeah. to decide to let the grip go. It's yeah. a, I think it's, I want to say that grip is banned in judo now. Um, in the modern game of judo, I know the belt grip from the back you can't hold on to for more than a couple seconds. I think this grip uh, you also can't break. The only way you can really break it is if you actually pop your head out on the other side of the grip. So then instead of being oh, yeah. on the same side, your cross side. I have a judoka in my club that I ask like these kind of questions to. Yep. And that, that's what he's talked about. So doing. in this case, uh, Dustin's hit- not able to do any of those things. And Seth hits an Uchimata, um, takes him down. Um, and basically they trade deep half positions here. So Dustin comes up on a on a deep half sweep and Seth starts, you know, it takes a little while. He's he's making sure that Dustin doesn't settle with head control. And then Seth gets to where he wants, which is the deep half. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> Seth is reaching over and Seth does an amazing job here at really pushing Dustin forward, um, getting Dustin to by default have to like push up on his hands Dude, Seth well, this is a gi match yeah. and Seth throws the lockdown in the gi really really well and I have seen very few dudes that Seth gets into that lockdown position be able to like sprawl out and move out unless they're like significantly bigger it's a really really powerful position in the gi and given Seth is an electric chair guy yeah he gets the lockdown you see him get that he sorry just basically windshield wrappers the leg over top of his if far he's side able shoulder. to get you to post out on your hands you are hooked and that's exactly what he's able to do which then allows Seth to position himself and basically you see Seth Gable grips across the leg starts wrenching down with the lockdown and then he has his hands Gable gripped over the thigh of the leg that is now over Seth's shoulder and he starts doing the twisting motion that you see in a straight arm yeah, bar Yeah, for like finish. the violent arm lock or like the uh, the gringo sweep. You see that kind of, they push on the point of the elbow and you rotate. Gordon Ryan does it a ton yep. from the butterfly guard to throw guys In over. this case, it's on the thigh just above the knee and it flares the, the, the knee out 
and then puts a ton of pressure on your groin and like gets an immediate tap from Dustin Peak for the electric chair finish. Have you ever uh, played against a guy that's like an electric chair guy? Yeah. Dude, it's terrible. It's awful. Like, if you get the lockdown, you're like, oh, cool, I'm going to have to fight super hard to not get electric chaired by you. Yeah. Or, sw- or or maybe you can get out of the electric chair, but you get swept with it. So, yeah. super strong position. I'm happy that Seth is still implementing the electric chair in the gi. Uh, gets to Seth. Next match. Wilson Heiss defeats... Wait, Ad- what was that? Wilson Heiss. 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 Defeats Adam Mazin by rear naked choke. Juan Kleber defeats Vinicius Lino by armbar. Dom Hoskins defeats Francisco Ituarde by split decision. I think this is Dom's 23rd or 22nd fight to win We appearance. keep saying that, and it's I like... I messaged Dom. I messaged Dom and Troy, oh, and I okay, figured okay. out. So, <laughs> I think this is I think this is 22nd or 23rd. I, okay. I think it's 22nd. Hell yeah. Troy has 27, so Dom is coming for that most appearances on fight to win title. Hell yeah. Um, Paulo Alves Magales Filo defeats uh, Gabriel Bergami by decision. Jacob Lee defeats Cody, and he has an interesting pronunciation here. I'm trying to remember how they said it. I would, if I'm reading this off the bat, I would say Legendre, but it's it's different than that. It's like it I looks can't like even... Cody Legendary. Is I think, kind of what I it... think that's what I think. I think that's how they said it actually. Uh, I think it's Cody Legendary because it ends with a R a D R E yeah. as opposed to a Y, but I th- it looks like Legendary to me. I think that's how they pronounce it. Yeah. So Jacob Lee defeats Cody Legendary. Duh, the decision, decision, and that was fight of the night for the black belts and. God damn, this is an exciting match. This is an amazing Nogi match. Um, Just great back and forth. Um, The commentator said it best. There's good flow in this match. Um, Basically, leg locks, back and forth. This is what I love to see in a fight to win match, where it's like guys will lock down position. We see with a huge portion of the match, Jacob Lee is just throwing up subs and throwing up offense in the legs and all the upper upper body positions and sweeps. And And neither person can really settle up until the end of the match in a in a good way you know like like there are they're basically transitioning yeah. in and out of it's stuff it's not garbage scrambles where you see nobody can establish it's both guys are no one's willing to hold down a position until like the end when Jacob Lee gets the back and it's like that's the one position that in this sort of matchup you get the back like okay I'm going to work on the back position and your job is to escape and, he, and Jacob is really active from the back here really oh, yeah. doing a great job he's not just holding chokes. back he's actually looking for the choke he's looking for positional offense and I really appreciate that but I really I loved this match because you saw both guys put it on the line in the fight to win rule set and really go for the finish the whole time and go for increasing their position and but not willing to just like stalemate and hold, you saw a lot of positions where both guys could have just kind of hung out and you didn't see that from the competitors. And I really appreciate that as a guy that watches um, an unhealthy amount of professional jiu-jitsu. I appreciate when guys put on the line and I'm, again, deservedly fight of the night. Jacob Lee gets it done, you know, throws up more. He's really active during the beginning of the match, gets the back, keeps putting it on, but isn't able to get the finish. Really great match from both guys. Like exactly what I love watching a fight to win. Hell yeah. Uh, next up we have... Uh Kanderson Picano defeating Matt Palupalele by decision. Eric Ursek defeats Sergio Rios by decision. Herman Torado defeats Jesse Taylor by split decision. Michael Trasso defeats Miha uh, Perhovec by decision. Stefan Martinez defeats Andy Burke by decision. Juarez Harless defeats Bruno Albuquerque by uh, something. <laughs> Chris Drods defeats Jeff Real by decision. Uh, Jorge Fanfan defeats uh, Jair Silva by decision. So it looks like George. Um, looks like Jair was on here twice then. This is his uh, first of two matches. Rodrigo uh, Munduruka defeats Orlando Cornell by decision. On to the brown belt results. Sean Joseph defeats Antonio Lopez by split decision. Uh, Carlo Boudreau defeats Javier Cosio by decision. Adolphus Moore defeats Mateus Gomez by choke. Uh, Zimitro Perez defeats Seymour Lewis. Um, that was fight of the night for the brown belts. Uh, Jason Cook defeats Adam Carson by Bravo Choke. And that was submission of the night for the brown belts. On to the purple belt results. Xavier Silva defeats Jacob Kasama by split decision. And that was fight of the night, and he retains the purple belt welterweight title. Matt Cox defeats... Oh, sorry, becomes, not retains. He becomes the purple belt, well, the purple belt welterweight champion now i'm butchering things worse than usual today matt cox defeats ed johnson by split decision and that was the and ed matt cox retains the purple belt middleweight nogi title oh man i'm struggling right now um zoe chiles defeats uh amaya allison by heel hook 
Uh, Amanda Bruce defeats Carolina Ramirez by knee bar. And that was submission of the night for the purple belts. Antonio Camerlato defeats Lucas Espinosa by decision. Alvin Ma defeats Brian DeLeon Guerrero by decision. Fernando Estevez defeats Matthew Culver by decision. On to the kids. Coco Blackwell defeats Sierra Fawn by split decision. And beca- and be- that was fight of the night for the kids and becomes the fight to win kids champion. Uh, Amos Michael Hofker defeats Alaya Nunez by split decision. Emily Leiva defeats Emmy uh, Bridgeland by armbar. And that was Mr. the Night for the kids. Anything else on Fight to Win? That's it. Dude, great event. I love when these guys go to San Diego because uh, it's just stacked, they bring the action. Man. And, dude, 45000 paid out to the athletes. That's a really, really good card. Love the San Diego cards. Love the NorCal cards. Always dope talent. Uh, great event. Highly recommend you go watch it. On to the next one. So on to our preview for Substars. This event is action-packed at the Fillmore in Miami Beach on February 21st. Um, Gary Tonin versus Dustin Poirier was supposed to be on this card. Uh, that match is now off. Uh, Gary Tonin posted on Twitter. He has a big cut over his eye, and he basically just can't. He has to heal it up so that he can go through a fight camp and potentially fight in April. So that sucks when I can see it. I'm not sure if they've actually given Dustin a replacement opponent yet, but it would be cool to see uh, Dustin fight or compete in jiu-jitsu, because I don't recall the last time I've seen him compete. Uh, there's also a, a four-man celebrity sumo tournament with Yama, with Rumble, with Curtis Blades, and someone and one other person. I'm not exactly certain going on. We may talk about that, may not. But let's get into like the headliner matchups. We have Cyborg Abreu versus Lovato. Uh, these guys met before, right? I don't yeah, recall I think when. So. Yeah. Cyborg talked about this a little bit when we were um, at Dallas. Well, he just said, he said Lovato was a beast, and like... You know, I don't know if that meant that Cyborg had watched Lovato a bunch or if they'd like met up. I imagine they they both been around for a while. They yeah, had to have met up. I know. I'm just. I know we should know. It's probably what's. Oh yeah, finals at ADCC. I'm like, oh, I should know that. Um, this is gonna be a dope matchup. I'm honestly really cons- really interested to see how this goes because Lovato has just retired from MMA due to all his brain stuff he has going on. Yeah. Um, so I'm super curious. Cyborg is on a hot streak currently, uh, having just won the Kasai Heavyweight Grand Prix. We've seen Lovato look really good in Fight to Win. We've seen him look really good at Polaris. Um, this is a really compelling matchup. I'm curious to see if both guys elect to wrestle or if we're going to see Cyborg pull guard and force Lovato to pass. I mean, we've seen Lovato be a really aggressive passer. We've seen Cyborg be really, really aggressive with the tornado guard from the bottom. But it potentially, given the kind of the size of both guys, it wouldn't surprise me to see both of them on the feet exchanging kind of like heavy collar ties and both looking for a takedown. So I looked it up real quick, by the way, um, and they've met uh, at least four times. Okay. Um, so they they meet in the majors a significant number of times. Okay. Brasileiros. You got what year? Worlds. Uh, the most recent meeting? Okay. So we have a 2007, a 2008, a uh, 2016, um, and another 2016. Okay. All wins for Lovato. Okay. So potentially this is Cyborg. Cyborg's been more active in Jiu-Jitsu. Lovato, again, still has not been... He's still been in Jiu-Jitsu matches and high-level matchups. I think his most recent matchup was against either at Polaris or versus Yuri Samos. It was a really close matchup at Fight to Win that wow. Yuri took. Actually, the third fight to win, they met. Um, and, oh, yeah. I knew that. Uh, okay. And um, Lovato won by Armin Guillotine. Yeah. So... Super excited for this one. This is going to be fireworks again. Wouldn't surprise me to see the one take it. But again, historically, thanks to me with the stats, yep. um, Lovato has taken this one, but Cyborg has been on a streak recently. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, like with Cyborg particularly act- active in the Nogi. Lately, yeah. So. And he's just in, in looking like better and better and just like implementing and just freaking both the guys are veterans. Next matchup, we have Gordon Ryan versus Aaron Johnson. Again, another rematch. And I think this one was uh, Gordon had first gotten black belt. I want to say this is 2014, and Aaron won. Tex yeah. Johnson is one of like five guys to ever defeat Gordon Ryan at black belt. Um, did he sub him, or was it a decision? It was a sub, I think. I yeah. think it was. So I think it was a sub. Uh, I'm super excited for this one because Tex Johnson. Tex Johnson we talked about last time. Tex Johnson, at any point in time, can sub anyone in the world. That is evident by the Felipe Pena sub at Kasai Pro 5, I think, where he hooks Felipe Pena. Again, a matchup most people didn't give him a ton of credence going into, and then that dude can pull it out. He, I mean, he has just hugely crazy finishes against high-level guys because he can just grab a leg and he can just go. I mean, there's videos of Tex Johnson on online breaking baseball bats, like, 
Dude has some great breaking power. I'm curious to see how Gordon Ryan approaches this one, if we're going to see him pathway to the back or if we're going to see him actually engage in a leg battle. Um, neither would really surprise me. I figure with Tex that he's going to decide to play from like the butterfly guard, force Tex to pass. Tex is going to go like really hard for the ankle like he does. Gordon's going to sweep. I feel, feel like Gordon's going to try to take the back off of that. Yeah, I, I I have difficulty predicting how this is going to go. Um, I could see Tex wanting to play guard. Um, you know, you kind of lock a, lock one down the guard. We yeah, we've seen we've seen Tex play some guard before. Again, I'm I'm we, curious. He to see plays a lot of guard. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious to see how their passing matches up. Gordon Ryan's passing has looked really really good, and we saw Tex Johnson have a little bit of problem with William Tackett recently with some of the guard passing. And Tackett and Gordon play kind of a similar passing style. Um, so it's it'll be really interesting. Again, I'm going to pick Gordon Ryan here, but again, Tex Johnson is a super unpredictable dude with the way he can finish guys and like when he can. When he shows up and performs like he's super hard to beat but again we see him uh versus the craig jones matchup you know craig grabs that kimura and cut pathways to his back so again this is a really interesting matchup especially because the two guys have history before with each other and tex actually has the win in the first matchup absolutely so next matchup we have is it's not going to load is it nope uh keep going Keep going. We have Keenan Cornelius versus Patrick Gaudio. The rematch we all wanted to see at the 2018 World Championships where Keenan may or may not have uh, actually won versus Gaudio if you actually read the rules. Right. Um, super controversial match back then. I'm really excited to see this. This was a really great match the first time. And the second match, I assume, is going to be amazing as well. I, for some reason, I feel like this is a... Uh, this is a gi match. I don't know if it is, but I assume it's a gi match. Um, I think Substars does both gi and no gi. I know typically they just do no gi, but it's really good. I'm we'll see how to see it goes. It. Go um, watch the first match. I know in the gi, like Keenan obviously has more uh, of an arsenal. Um, so I mean, I'll be yeah, curious to see how it goes. That was the year Gaudio won gold. Yeah, like it's. Gaudio is a dude. You saw him win Europeans like two weeks ago. He pulled out a Kasai. We did an interview with him. That's on the Grappling Ground YouTube page. Looks really good. It's a super compelling matchup. Go watch the first matchup in 2018 to see how it played out. Um, I Again, I foresee it going a very similar way, being a super closely contested matchup. I'm excited for it. Next up, we got Wagner versus Thiago. Is it Silva? I, I do not know. I don't recognize. <laughs> it's, see, I'm looking at a side profile view, and I'm trying. Oh, it's a uh, UFC fighter. Uh, Thiago... Moises. Okay. I don't. I'm not super familiar with Tiago. I don't watch nearly as much MMA as I used to. Um, dude, Wagner's hard to beat. We're also in Miami with Wagner, and I think Wagner. What was it? It was one of the size that Wagner did. Um, he wins, and he goes ah, and he like yells, and he goes, "No one can beat me in Miami." And <laughs> I want to say, I think I don't think Wagner's ever been defeated in Miami. Yeah. By the way, hometown court, home court advantage for sure. Yeah, dude, and just uh, is super strong. Uh, his opponent is Thiago Moises. Uh, oh shit! Way. Okay, that's I. I'm more familiar with Thiago Moises. Okay. Uh, uh, next up, this is going to be fire. Enrico Coco versus Ethan Crellinston. Holy shit! That's that is a fire right? fucking match. Um, I, I see leg locks in our future for this one. Yeah, we saw we saw Enrico uh, Enrico really uh, fuck somebody Jitsking. up. Jitsking. Um even before the, was it Jits King? I think it was Steel. No, that was Combs. Um, we saw we saw I think live it was one of the events Boogie. that we went it was to. Boogie. We just saw him beat Boogie at Jits King with um, heel hook in oh, in overtime. You no nah, that. I'm thinking of something else. I'm thinking of you and I were. Oh, uh, fight to win, fight to win Philly. Yeah, that's he what was it a was. fight to win Philly, and he beat he uh, beat one of the Philly black belts. Yeah, for the title, it mm -hmm. was he won he won a masters title or a regular. I think it was a masters title. Yeah. at fight to win Philly. Yeah, and he looked fucking amazing. Yeah, dude, Cronston though coming off. Oh of my god, Parabellum Quintet and ADCC and that ADCC camp. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of Carlinson lately. We're very high on him. We like him a lot. Yeah. Uh, we like his style. Like he's a finisher. He's a guy that's always actively looking for the sub and looking for the finish. He pathways really well to the back. We he, saw him really well, a lot in Shugio as well, mm -hmm. which was really excellent. Um, yeah. Great finishing from the back. He's got good leg locks. Uh, he did a really cool podcast, um, him and Oliver Taza on, uh, I think it was off balance, which is Pierre, which is Pierre Oliver Leclerc's podcast with Oliver Taza. They both run it together, but it was them talking about, uh, 
uh, Quintet Parabellum. Yep. And it was a really interesting thing to hear, talk, hear about them both talking about competing in Canada because they're both Canadian guys and at a TriStar. And it was a really interesting and insightful podcast. I recommend that you, if you're interested in these guys or you've watched Cronston before, listen to it. It's like 35 minutes, I think. It's super like dense information-wise and great. And it gives a little more insight into kind of what Cronston does to prepare and like what his thought process was. If you listen to this show, it's it's information from both guys presented in a way that's that you'll probably enjoy, and I recommend you go watch it. Uh, yeah, it's that, gonna be that's going to be a really fun really matchup. That's going to be hard to pick. Also in this matchup, we have Nick Rodriguez versus... Who is he versus here? Versus... Oh, Roosevelt Souza. Yeah. This will be a lot of fun. I think Roosevelt Souza is the uh, qualifies the challenger winner. Um that should be a lot of fun as well. We also have uh, Wagner Hosh's daughter on this card. We have Dan Martinez on this card. We have Maggie Grindotti versus Luisa Alexuguir. This is good. Yeah. Uh, Maggie, we saw at Europeans, look good. She had a little trouble at Europeans in the black belt division. Now she's a black belt. We're starting to see her against the uh, top upper echelon black belt competitive women. I am excited for it. Also on this card, we have Ro- uh, Jasmine, Jasmine Rocha, Rocha. Yep. versus um, Hey Sunny, Gordon yep. Ryan's girlfriend. Um, I, can't, I never get her name. Yeah. Because now her Instagram's gone because it got, it violated terms of service because she showed, I believe, uh, too much. Well, anyway, her last name is Santoro. I'm, I don't think I've ever seen her role before, so yeah. that should be really interesting. We've covered her a couple times on Kasai's and on, uh, I think, one of the early Jits Kings. She had a really nice come from behind win, uh, I think think at one of the Jits Kings where she was kind of on the back and then she pulls out an arm bar in like the dying seconds of the match or pulls out a choking run in the dying seconds of the match. Really interesting grappler. Um, and she's under the Gordon Ryan like tutelage. She's rapidly increasing. I think she's a blue or purple belt. Now, I know Jasmine Rocha is a purple belt. Yeah. Um, That'll be an awesome match. That's a so. really, really good match. So it's a well-matched matchup. Mikey Perez is also on this card. There's a bunch of talent on here. Dude, it's um, a stacked card. I think it's yeah. 10 bucks. Yeah. Like this is insane value for money. If you're interested in watching it, like, like this is a card that, again, we don't push a ton of pay-per-views on the show because I think a lot of them don't sort of live up or not worth it. This, this has the quality Dude, to justify it. There's yeah. a couple matches on here that are worth the money in itself, like the Gordon Ryan matchup, like the Wagner matchup, the Ethan matchup. Like, all of those are headline matchups on other promotions. The Cyborg and Lovato matchup. Yeah. Like, it's it's worth 10 bucks, I think nine ninety nine for this I'm excited for this card. I'm still looking at flights to see if I can go down. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to, which I'm kind of upset about, but it's yep. going to be a great card. Any closing thoughts on it, Demir? No, nah, man, it's going to be fire. All right, that does it for Substars. So on to our preview of Sug 11. This one has a number of um, interesting matchups on it. You want to start, start, start with the tag team matchups or end with tag All team right. matchups? Normally, these kind of freak show matchups, I'm like, whatever, but... There's some legitimately entertaining matchups. We have tag team jujitsu matches. Tag team Nikki Rod and Craig Jones versus tag team Vinny Magalhaes and Kyle Bain. So I'm curious to see if Vinny is uh, in or out of this. They haven't announced a replacement yet for it, but we saw Vinny injured. He had like a groin hamstring issue at Kasai Pro in Dallas, I think, uh, what is it, two weeks ago? Two, three weeks ago, something like yeah, that? Yeah, two weeks ago, I think. Two weeks ago, so I'm curious to see if they're going to replace him. Um, again, now we've seen Craig, or we've seen uh, Nicky Rod actually go against both Kyle Bame, who he has a victory over, and we see him draw versus Mini, Mini, Mini Magalhaes, Vinny Magalhaes, and in the interview I did with Nick Rodriguez at Backstage at Kasai Pro in 7, he's like, man, I might just have Craig stay home, and I'll take both these guys on. Yeah. So <laughs> Nick, Nick Rodriguez is uh, somewhat confident going into this matchup, but again, tag team is super is a super strange thing. The other interesting thing is both Craig and Nick Rodriguez train together sometimes and yep. Vinny and Kyle actually train, train together. together yeah. So it's interesting we that saw we see Vinny, two guys that are actually training together on the same team. We saw Vinny and Kyle um, cornering for each other uh, over at Kasai. Yeah. And they um, actually talked about in both interviews I did with Vinny and Kyle that's up on the Grappling Grind uh, Facebook YouTube page right now. Um, they talk about you know bringing each other in and actually training with each other ahead of the Kasai tournament. So Really interesting tag team matchup. I've given its tag team. I have no idea how to predict it or not. Um, they were very interesting before to watch. So 
potentially going to be very interesting to watch this time. Um, also on this card, we have Austin Vanaford and Gabriel Zangief Chico versus Ragin Al Iaquinta and Platinum Mike Perry. I think Holy it's Iaquinta is how you pronounce that. It's Iaquinta? Okay. Iaquinta. Yeah, Al Iaquinta. Oh my God. This is going to be. The fucking memes that can come out of that fucking matchup. Dude. Holy shit. Yeah, I, honestly, like Mike Perry's not a bad grappler. We've seen him, I think, on Sug. I think we've seen him on Kasai. I think we've seen like he. We've seen him in the Gi. He's a purple belt. Yeah, he's a legit like grappler. and Iaquinta, legit wrestler. Like it's well, Iaquinta is like, yeah, he's fucking good. Dude, look I mean, good against Khabib. Like, yeah. mm, he's pretty, pretty fucking good. Yeah. So they get an interesting matchup. Um, we continue. Yeah. yeah. Um, Iaquinta also training with like the Weidman crew, and Weidman's a fucking amazing black belt as well. Yeah. So we have Jake Shields versus uh, Richie Martinez. This is actually like Boogie. low key. Uh, I think potentially could be a really competitive matchup. It's an interesting matchup for sure. Um, you know, I, we see Jake going for a lot of control, Boogie not giving a fuck about like position, position like, p- like being able to throw shit up for LOL like, all position. over. And with Sug, Sug typically uses the EBI overtime rules. Yeah. So, which we know Boogie is super, <laughs> super <laughs> familiar with and has a lot of victories. That via changes the rules. things with Kyle Bame and everything. So, well, no, that's a tag team match. Oh, so the tag team don't, doesn't I have, follow. I, honestly, I have no idea how tag team matches work because they so, end with folding chairs and shit. Dude, they're yes. So, they're so I'm weird. All about this shit. You know, I know, and I'm just. They're so weird. I Main, have no you can't idea. see this unless you're watching the YouTube. But Maine is like holding his head, embarrassed for me. I don't give a fuck, Maine. I don't give a fuck. I know, Emil. I know, Emil. So fuck. Those are the big. Those are the big matches. Make this a ladder match, dude. Ugh. Any of the pro wrestling shit. Fucking folding chairs. Refs getting knocked it is, out. It is Chael Sonnen's organization. So like, all of that is potentially possible oh, so man. that's all i Hell got yeah. for sug 11 you got anything else on sug 11 no nah, man all right let's move on to the art give me the word here, here. artisa invitational Art- 2 this is a super good invitation we saw this last time i think it was headlined last time by bill cooper versus jonta alves and when jonta alves was still a brown belt or purple belt or something well now it's marcio andre versus jonathan alves oh, artisa invitational one the second one, this one is uh, yeah. is dope. Yeah, this 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 one that's coming up is Marcio Andre headlined Marcio Andre versus Jonathan Alves. We've seen Jonathan just fucking wreck and house. Dude, he's been in Black everyone's Pop. corner recently. If you're yeah. in AOJ, I think on Tuesday number one, he was in like every single AOJ's fighter along with Hoffa. Yeah, like dude's a monster. We, I mean, he's. This year on the short list for guys that you're potentially are coming for a black belt world title. Yeah. Looked really good. Marcio, again, one of the veteranist veterans. It's a gi matchup. Um, so potentially yeah. I might favor. We saw Jonathan fucking submit Shane Jamil Hill Taylor at Spider in like a minute or was something. Wasn't even a minute. Was it even a minute? That's fucking bonkers. Yeah, it's crazy. Like he's, he's on a he's on a different level right now. I honestly I see him looking for the sub on Marcio, but Marcio is just is such a veteran. It's so hard to put away. Like yeah. I I assume he's not going to get the submission, but I assume it's going to be a hotly contested match, and I'm interested to see kind of the way that Jonathan like approaches this matchup, yeah. um, and if he decides to just like go full ham and go through, or he wants to play a more tepid game versus Marcio. I'm I'm assuming it's going to be more tactical. I'm assuming this is one of those games where like, you know, like a single grip will determine yeah. the outcome, and it'll be on a level that like I cannot comprehend. Yeah, I, I, um, I just had that feeling too. It's going to be on that. Like I'm looking at it's like they're doing things that I don't understand because they're sitting in this position <laughs> and they're both looking for like this inch of grip yeah. because th- they want to do something at a level that I don't understand. So yeah. super excited for this match. They also have a black and brown belt absolute bracket with a thousand dollar cash prize with names that are uh, legit too small for me to read. Um, man, my eyesight's going bad meal. What you got? A lot of really high level guys. Yeah. I don't recognize any of the names actually. So, uh, uh, I, I, we have uh, Tynan Dalpra, the yeah. AOJ guy, most likely going to take it, the AOJ prodigy. Ryan Aiken, uh, Joe Watson, um, Pedro Pajares. Uh, uh, Renda Mutliab Mut- is in here. Yeah. Akbari is in here. Um, oh, yeah. and this is actually no joke, like on a crazy bracket. Like, Tynan could take this, Mutliab could take this. Um, this would be a lot of fun. I'm not actually sure where this one's going to be streaming, um, but I know we're probably going to we're going to post about it in the next coming 
in the next couple of days on our Instagram page, once we get some streaming information, uh, it looks like a really great event. I highly recommend that you tune in for this one as well. You got anything else, man? That's it. All right. So moving into the outro section of the show, uh, how's your how's your day off been, Emil? It's been great. I'm just trying to recuperate. I'm now thankfully fucking getting over this cold. Yeah, you uh, were rough last week. It yeah. was. Oh yeah. Sorry I, to I, everybody for the fucking coughing fits that I had. Um, I was editing it like, oh my god, Emil, why why you gotta do this, all the listeners? Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, how's your week going? It's going good. So I found my brother. Uh, so my brother is stationed in San Diego. Um, I don't know what about his personal life people want to hear or people <laughs> he wants me to tell people, but he texted me. He was like, yeah. So I started training jujitsu um, with uh, Chris Lieben. And he was like, and this and Barry Yoshida. I was like, wait, what? And he like didn't know who Barry Yoshida was. I was like, okay, so let me learn you first of all. And then yeah, he's also like boxing. It's really, it's really funny out of nowhere. Our brother like who knew who knows I do jujitsu and knows like it's a huge piece of my life. And we've trained together occasionally because he wrestled in high school. But it was really funny to have him basically out of the blue go, yeah, I'm training with these guys. I'm like it's awesome. Jujitsu is great. I'm like I know. I've been telling you for the past like. I don't know, seven years that it's great and that you should do it because you're stupid athletic for no reason. And I was training in San Diego with Lieben and Yoshida. And That's I'm like, hilarious. Oh, cool. Now you're training with like amazing world-class level guys and you're super athletic and younger than me. So this is going to go well for me in eight, <laughs> two years. Like he's going to visit and want to grapple. I'm just like, man, well, you like a athletic white belt now, but you're training with high level guys. So I'm going to have to like... <sighs> It's just not going to be good for me. That's dope. That's fucking hilarious. It is man. really funny. After years and years and years, like all of a sudden he stumbles into Yoshida's gym. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Well, that's San Diego for you. I mean, you can't I fucking know. throw a rock without hitting an amazing gym like out a there. a world so. champion, 80cc level guy. Yeah. Like, dude, it's so it's really funny that he's like, I texted him that, you know, Yoshida's fighting like right now on Fight Twin. He goes, really? I was like, yeah, I'm going to listen to our show. My brother. That's hilarious. So, yeah, it's, it's really funny turn of events. This so week. now like three years into you making the podcast or however long it's been. I know. It's been about your brother two and a half listening. years. Yeah. My brother is probably going to tune in and be like, oh yeah, you know, just you. I'm like, yes, I'm, I know a couple things about the sport that you've just wandered into. That's so funny. For no reason. So it's been, it's been a funny week for me. Uh, we're looking to do an in-house thing this week at the gym or next week at the gym for some of the students for the university and bringing a bunch of people in the affiliation together to do like an in-house thing. Looking forward to that. I always love uh, pushing the students into competition for the first time you know it's an in-house thing it's always really funny to talk about it's like do this show and then coach a bunch of white belts because it's like oh yeah i gotta teach you how to do these like these basic things that we talk about on the show and so it's always an exciting time um you're next week yeah i'm here man nice when's the next time you're on vacation or travel not until like fucking april thankfully so ah, nice yeah so yeah it's a rare calm calm time for a meal you just you're just enjoying like man like being home on the weekends is it's an amazing time yeah. So How's your training going? Uh, it was going, well, I can't say that it was going good. It was good to be back. I got fucking steamrolled and then I got fucking sick. Uh-huh. Uh, so, um, but you know, I'm, I'm done coughing my brains out now. So I'll, I'll be back on the mats this week. Awesome. So. I signed up for my first tournament in like a year and a half since breaking my back. Hell yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for it. That's I, had, I always had a coupon. Like I, I had a, I had a refund coupon from back in 2018 when I broke everything that uh, I applied for this event. I was like, that's awesome. Thanks grappling industries for uh, holding on to that for me for a year and a half. So it'll Dope. be, it'll be fun. I'm excited. Um, you got anything else? That's it, man. All right. So uh, as always on the show, I'm your host Maine, and I'm your co-host Emil and we got the grappling rewind. We'll see you on the mat. If you like the show, please consider sharing it on Facebook with the folks at your gym. It's the best way that we grow the show and we really appreciate it. You can reach out to us on email. We also have Instagram. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. We have Google+. Plus. Until that shuts down. We have a website. If you have an event you would like to have us cover, please let us know. If you have a name, like most people do, and you'd like to have us stop butchering it, let us know. Reach out to us. The show is also available on YouTube, Spotify, in addition to iTunes and every other podcast service. We very much appreciate your time and thank you.